on the Egyptian Revolution uh, in 2016 and has also published on American studies in the shadow of Orientalism, also in 2016. Today's talk is part of her ongoing research uh, on the superhero genre in Arabic culture, which is a lot of fun and uh, um, so, without further ado, I'd like to uh, welcome Mira and ask you to help, her, help me welcome her as well. Thank you. Thank you, Samia. Um, thank you for coming out uh, today. Um, this is, again, as Samia said, um, very much in progress. The project is very much in progress, so there are bound to be a lot of gaps at this uh, point. Which some of which I will definitely uh, point out, but some of which you will feel and maybe you will help me, you know, uh, uh, help point out these gaps for me. Um, like I guess, like every uh, research project, uh, mine also starts with a story. So I'm going to begin with the story and then move on to uh, less entertaining uh, uh, stuff. So about two years ago now. Um, I was having a dinner with a group of my friends of different age groups, and um, um, we somehow we started reminiscing about you know the kind of uh, material books that we were encouraged to read as we were growing up in uh, in Egypt. And um, I remember Muhammad, uh, who was the youngest of the group. He's a visual artist, and he was uh, 29 years old then. Um, he said how he would uh, you know he remembered how he waited impatiently for you know the the the, the, the superhero comics, uh, the monthly superhero comics, um, and, he would, and he said that he learned how to um, uh, paint by sketching and drawing his favorite uh, superheroes. Um, while uh, while I was wondering whether Muhammad had learned, to, in fact, to, to paint by copying his favorite superheroes, as he said or whether in fact he found in drawing them a means of holding onto them for a longer period of time after the act of reading the comic itself was over and retrieving them whenever he wanted to, Muhammad meanwhile was struggling with his own dilemma when in fact one of uh, the members of the group, another um, a professor of literature in his 60s, asked him whether he had read the comics in, uh, in English or in Arabic translation. Muhammad who grew up in the 90s in Egypt um, and had read the comics in, uh, in English, in fact, never knew that they had been translated into Arabic, let alone an Arabized version. And um, I use the word Arabized here with some, um, you know, with some skepticism because I'm not really sure whether it is an appropriate term to use or not. Maybe you can help me out with that as we go on. Um, Muhammad, who grew up reading the superhero comics, as I said, in English in the 90s, in fact, never knew that they were available in Arabic, Arabic translation, let alone an Arabized version. The shock of discovery that his favorite heroes, Clark Kent and Bruce Wayne, have become Nabil Fawzi and Sophie, the Arabic names for the superheroes in, uh, in the Arabic translation, left him speechless and completely disillusioned. These were the names that the, the, the superheroes had actually you know, acquired as they were translated into, uh, uh, into Arabic language. Uh, Nabil, Fawzi, Nabil Fawzi was uh, Superman, uh, Sophie was uh, Batman, and you had all the other characters, you know, uh, Ramda, uh, Sharif, Buddha, Salah, and, and, and every, you know, all the other characters. Um, in fact, he could not see any sense in the act of translating what seemed to him a very culturally specific product best enjoyed in its original form. I later discovered that he was not the only person who believed in the fact that superhero comics should be actually read in the original language. Others actually joined him in, in the same, uh, had the same feeling. I tried to understand the reason behind Muhammad's disappointment. Was it the allure that was lost when his favorite superheroes assumed the mundane identity of Nabi Fawzi, Subhi, Buddha, Sharif, Randa, Salah, and all the other characters whose names were translated into Arabic? Or was it the act of shattering the make-believe world of the superheroes by assuming names that carried different cultural implications, and therefore universalizing the phenomenon that he has associated for so long with American values, whatever these values meant to him. At the same time, I also realized that I was witnessing two contradictory reactions. The reaction of Muhammad, um, the 29-year-old who had grow, uh, you know, grown up reading these comics in English, and the older professor who had grown up uh, in, 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 in uh, 
in the 60s and who read them in the 60s and read them and enjoyed them in Arabic translation. In fact, um, the politics of translating the superhero comics into Arabic language sheds light on the intricate U.S.-Egypt relationship. In the following section, I will try and throughout the lecture, I will try to trace uh, this trajectory of uh, U.S.-Egypt uh, relations um, by um, through the translation initiatives of the comics. Let me uh, start by showing you some. So I'm going to leave Muhammad and maybe return to uh, to him later on, but move on to the story of to the uh, publications of um, these uh, uh, comics. The first Arabic translation of the comics was published in Beirut, in uh, Lebanon, in 19, exactly 1963, by Dar al-Mabwa al um, Nobody actually really knows the full story of how these, you know, these uh, uh, comics were translated. But I managed to put together the story by looking into different sources and also by talking to uh, someone, um, Henry Matthews, who, was, uh, who, who, who published this uh, uh, and he was also working in Dar al Mabat in Musawara at a certain point in his uh, career. So here goes the story. Um, the house, um, the Dar al Mabat in Musawara, was established after negotiations between DC Comics, which holds the copyright for Superman, and the Egyptian publishing house Dar al Hilal Fate. Now what happened was that DC Comics started negotiations with Dar al Hilal. Dar al Hilal announced in one of its um, magazines, Sabir, that it was uh, going to uh, introduce a new hero. And it uh, asked the readers to come up with names for this uh, hero. And there was a competition and people came up with names like uh, Qahir and Zafir and Nasir, which all had you know, um, um, implications of you know, the, the, the victorious, uh, the, the winner, the vanquisher, you know, and Nasser, of course, after Gamal Abdel Nasser, who was you know, perceived as the hero par excellence in, the, in, in Egypt, in the Arab world, and in, in Africa in general. Uh, DC Comics did not necessarily like the way the negotiations were going, and uh, they did not want uh, to create you know, an, an Arab hero. And so somehow the negotiations failed, and instead they helped Ms. Nadia Nashat, who was the editor in chief, who became the editor in chief of uh, later on Dar uh, al Musawar, to help set up house in, uh, in, in, in Lebanon and Beirut. And they gave her the copyright for Superman with the promise of other uh, uh, superhero comics to follow, uh, like Batman and so on. And this is how it all uh, started. Um, the comics were very successful. They were distributed around uh, across the Arab world, and Egypt became the number one uh, market. It is said that Dar al Musawara published about the early, uh, early on around 100,000 copies, about 95,000 of which were actually uh, uh, distributed in Egypt by Dar by um, Al Ahram Publishing House. However, despite their huge uh, success and with the introduction of other, of other superhero comics like uh, Batman in 1965, the translations were often interrupted because of several things. Um, because of financial reasons, um, uh, especially after 1967 when Egypt stopped importing you know, um, the, the, the superhero comics in, into, in, in, into Egypt, and also with the Lebanese civil war, sometimes you know, the publications would just simply stop because of the war. So in order, because of, the, and, and because of these uh, uh, financial fluctuations, the comic series underwent some changes to try and cater to the Arab reader and sustain a wider distribution. Some of these changes involved combining several hero adventures in the same edition to appeal to a wider audience. So they would, for example, uh, compile uh, you know, uh, uh, an edition that included um, the comics, superhero, um, uh, uh, Superman comics and Batman comics, for example to um, reduce the, the costs and also to you know, encourage more readers to buy these um, editions. While others introduced, um, sorry, uh, some of the changes also involved combining several superhero adventures in the same edition to appeal to a wider audience, while others introduced new descriptors to the characters to create a less alienating environment for readers to interact with their favorite superheroes. So Batman, for example, became 
العملاق العملاق والرجل الروبوت سبايدر مان سبايدر مان بيكيم الرجل العنكبوت and all these Arabic descriptions of the characters this was also in a way possible because of the constant evolving nature of the original superheroes which in turn allowed the Arabized version more flexibility as long as it observed the main frame of the original comics however the Arabization process which had defined the early translations of the comics eventually gave way in the late 70s and early 80s to a close translation of the original series when uh, the publishing house Doran Lotta took over the copyright of uh, um, the, the superhero comics and uh, at that time US Egyptian relations were um, on much better terms uh, Sadat and uh, 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 later Hosni Mubarak you know were on good terms with uh, the US as opposed to uh, no, sir. And so um, what happened was very interesting because if, uh, when Nara and Nanda took over the, the publication of the superhero comics, they dropped Nabil Fauzi and Sophie and returned to the original names of Peter Clark and Bruce Wayne and the other characters. Um, the comics became another much coveted American cultural product, especially with the Hollywood movies and later the video games and superhero merchandise and insignia. Now, I had a chance to look at the early, um, the very early uh, translations of uh, the comics. Um, I had a research grant in, 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 uh, in Beirut in, in the summer, and so I had a look at uh, the, the ones that they uh, were able to uh, collect. And also, there is a website in Egypt, uh, Arab Comics, that is you know compiling all of these and, and uh, all of these early translations. So when I looked at these translations, several things became clear to me. Um, one, of the, the first thing was that I was no longer sure about the term Arabization, because yes, the, the names, at least of the older egos, were translated. So you had Nabi Kauzi, you had uh, uh, Sopi, you had Ramda, and so on. You also had uh, the names of cities, for example, translated. So you had more and you had Zeus. You know, these were the cities where you know Batman, uh, uh, Superman grew up and uh, you know inhabited. Um, but other than that, you did not really have you know. Other than that, the vocabulary remained you know more or less Westernized. So uh, the, the 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 names, for example, Superman, you know, was published with the name Superman. Batman, it's true that Batman was, you know, the publication came out as and was what with, you know, between brackets, Batman. But they were referred to, I mean, in, in the superhero comics, they were referred to as Superman unless he was, you know, posing as the alter ego, so Nabil Fauzi. Batman was, you know, was referred to as Batman. But other than that, you know, Krypton remained, Krypton, the, the reference to Kryptonite and so on was the same. Nothing changed there. So I'm not exactly sure whether urbanization is a, is a good, you know, description for these translations or not. That was uh, the, the first um, observation that I had. The second thing was um, the selection of the translated comics. So not everything was translated. And when I talked to um, Henry Matthews, uh, he pointed out that um, um, not everything, the editors actually did not think that all the, you know, the, the different uh, comics were culturally appropriate for the Arabic market. So they would actually, you know, choose the kind of comics they would uh, they would translate, which meant that there wasn't really, you know, um, it wasn't really um, there wasn't really a, a sequence to the, the translations. Um, uh, so the, the idea of the cultural inappropriateness was was also significant because, you know, with the increase in the violence and you know sex and drugs and so on. Uh, it, it became, you know, uh, important to choose which kind of material to, to include. This pointed out my attention to something else, that even though the uh, comics themselves, you know, the magazines themselves were um, were published and, you know, it, it said somehow on the, 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 the page that they somehow catered to all age groups, in fact, they were regarded as, you know, um, content that was suitable for children, or that was, you know, published basically for children, and maybe, you know, maybe some, you know, early adults. But, but, you know, the major publications were for children, and that was very significant because, of course, it brings to mind what Edward Said said about in his forward to Palestine, um, the graphic uh, uh, 
novel that was published by Joe Sacco, how you know um, the, the comics are always somehow um, connected with you know young uh, children and so on. That also made me realize something else that the magazines that were published were actually magazines. Uh, and they were different from the superhero comics in the sense that they included other material besides the, uh, the, the, the comics itself. So for example, you'd have uh, you know, other um, translated stories from world literature, for example. You'd have other material from you know, stories from al Fadila uh, Leila. You would have, um, and that was something very interesting, you'd have some, for, first of all, some games and some competitions and some Things like, for example, Kaifa Tosbah Superman thing. That was very, very interesting with some exercises and so on. Uh, it would include, included a lot of ads. In other words, it was a magazine. There was a lot of, course, uh, a lot of uh, information, general information, general knowledge information, and so on. And that, um, um, and as I talked with, with, with uh, Penny Matthews, he, what he said was that um, because, you know, uh, the superhero comics were kind of regarded as, you know, trivial material. They wanted to give these magazines a sense of, you know, that they were serious content. That actually, uh, this is these are, uh, this is material that can be actually used as, for example, extracurricular, you know, uh, you know, activities and so on in schools, and they could be they would be endorsed by schools and so on. And it was also a way of, you know, um, uh, selling and marketing uh, these uh, these comics. Um, now, um, I tried by looking at these superhero comics, I was um, not only concerned with the translation of the comics itself, but I was also interested in the translation of the whole genre, not just simply the comics. So I tried to read the act of translating the superhero genre in Arabic culture within the framework of transnational American studies that seeks to investigate U.S. cultural, political, and economic manifestations beyond the borders of the nation state. Now, that despite the problems of the, of the term transnational, transnationalism associated with American studies and issues pertaining to the ongoing debate at the end of the American century, it seemed to reflect appropriately the tension between forms of American neo-imperialism and the cultural appropriation of the way these cultural, American cultural products were appropriated into our markets. In fact, a good portion of the scholarship on the superhero genre, and not much really has been you know, uh, published about that, um, particularly addressed this point, the idea of the universalization of the genre. Now, a quick look, for example, at the discussion of um, that happens on the forum uh, uh, website of Arab Comics, for example, shows an awareness and a critique of different forms of U.S. cultural domination in the Middle East, and uh, through its soft power, like for example, hip hop and of course superhero comics, and at the same time an avid interest in and mass consumption of U.S. culture, which of course problematizes the whole issue of the end of the American century and the declension of American power. Now, I'm going to leave this and return for a second to Muhammad, our friend. Because um, while I was contemplating you know, more about you know, how these uh, superhero comics uh, were a manifestation of uh, you know, uh, the, American, uh, the infiltration of American culture into the Egyptian market, the genre took an unexpected turn, in my opinion, which made me rethink my assumptions. After our dinner gathering, our disillusioned friend Muhammad decided to commemorate the moment by creating a Facebook group that included our group of friends and called it in Arabic, Al Abtal, Group Al Abtal Al Khalatin, Nabil Fawzi, Osubhi. The superhero group, Nabil Fawzi and Subhi. Now we have a WhatsApp group as well. Al Khalakun al Dirbuna Mugaddaba. And that is how I found myself overnight part of the genre. A superheroine, if you wish, without the extraordinary powers that characterize the superheroes. But I wasn't the only superheroine around. The genre had proliferated in the Arab world. More characters assume the superhero identity as part of the universalization of the genre, but also in response to the recent turn of DC Comics and Marvel to include a wider variety of superhero characters that speak to social diversity. Now, a, there is, in fact, at this moment, a lot. This is some of the material that was published, included in the DC Comics, as you see, for example, a poem by uh, Khalil Mukran. 
again, some games and, and uh, competitions and so on, stories. Okay, now, Qahira. This is one of the most recent uh, super heroines. And she, uh, she was uh, 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 published by uh, Dina Muhammad uh, in 2013. It, made, it first made its debut in uh, 2017. And of course, um, she's not the only one. Um, Super, for example, the 99 superheroes appeared drawing their superpower from the 99 names and attributes of God in the Quran. So the 99 this was a poetry publication. And there is a lot. Those of you who managed to go to, for example, the, the comic uh, uh, festival that was you know, held for the second time, and you know, many were on the board, I think, of uh, that second festival. Um, I've seen a, a lot of the genres actually from uh, proliferating, and not just su superheroes, but you know, a lot of you know, comics are coming out. Um, also, about the same time that all of these heroes were making their appearance on, uh, on the market, about the same time, Spider-Man suddenly appeared on the streets of Cairo. His unprecedented physical appearance created emotional havoc, especially amongst the Egyptian children, who were super excited to see their beloved superhero within reach. Everybody wanted to touch him, and children asked him to fly around as he does in his comics and films. Instead, the superhero was engaged in um, everyday mundane activities. He was doing his laundry, running to catch the bus, a daunting task in the overcrowded streets of Cairo, smoking a hookah, on the rooftop of a building overlooking a squatter area in Cairo, and even attempting to pray in a mosque. The stunt was pulled off by two people, Adif Saad, a 21-year-old chef who works at an Italian restaurant in, in Cairo and who posed as Spider-Man, and his friend Hossam Adif, a 20-year-old freelance uh, photographer who undertook the project, and uh, as he says, and I'm quoting him, to highlight the everyday difficulties Egyptians face, but in a funny way. According to Atif, Cairo is an overpopulated city. The traffic and public transportation are crazy. With all the power blackouts and other stuff, I find it difficult to live. But we still do, which makes Egyptians superheroes. As I mentioned earlier, much of the scholarship on the superhero genre engage with the idea of the evolving nature of the superhero tradition. While this may not, may not be of direct interest to my study, it is nevertheless important to contemplate not in the comparative sense of how Superman, Spider-Man, Batman, Wonder Woman, Catwoman, and so on, and the other heroes have undergone slight changes in their appearance, physique, uh, mannerisms, costumes, and so on, or even in the introduction of new characters, but in the concept of change itself and its implications in sustaining the genre and the interest of fans worldwide. Hatfield, Heer, and Worcester argued, though, in their recent study on the superhero genre, which was published in 2013, very recently, that despite this evolving nature, Three elements, and this is very important, three elements have always remained constant. These are, number one, a pro-social mission. They all engage in a pro-social mission. They have a pro-social mission. They have extraordinary powers and a double identity. In fact, my first reaction to the Spider-Man photo project was greatly influenced by this reading of the genre. And this is how I first thought of it. Egyptians were looking to Spider-Man for help, believing that his superpowers could indeed save them from an everyday reality that was becoming harder and harder to live through, yet alone tolerate. After all, the photo stunt was carried out in very impoverished working class areas in Cairo, where people were suffering the most, trying to make ends meet. Why else would Spider-Man appear on the streets of Cairo during Ramadan at the time when people break their fast to give out food, which actually happened? It simply seemed another manifestation of the far-reaching influence of American culture, its consumption and reappropriation into Egyptian society. But then I realized that this is a problematic interpretation. Despite attempting to read the phenomenon within the transnational framework that examines how American culture acquires a life and a voice of its own beyond its national parameters, and examining this transnational voice as an authentic intake on American culture and civilization, I was nevertheless recreating the exceptionalist model all over again by centering America in my reading of the phenomenon. Those of you who are not uh, aware of the exceptionalist model, it's basically you know, uh, the idea that America is exceptional you know, in everything. Simplistically thought, it puts it that it, America is basically you know, this exceptional place, exceptional you know, culture, um, 
Um, anyways, looking back at the pictures and Hosama out of statements and re-examining them in light of the agreed upon three constant elements that characterize the superhero tradition, I came to realize that it is possible to shift the focus away from the US. Obviously, the superhero genre is being used differently this time. It has undergone a change more radical than the 60s when the comics were Arabized or translated, whatever term you want to use. This was no super powerful persona on a pro social mission. In other words, he is simply another Egyptian trying to survive in a city that is making it impossible for its citizens to live a decent life. Therefore, his heroism lies in his ability to go on living against all odds, including being picked off the streets by security forces who deem him a threat to society. Now, if we look back at the picture where he tries to catch the, to catch the bus, for example, the focus, this is him doing some stunts. If we look back at the picture where he tries to catch the bus, for example, the focus is in fact on the hand stretched out to help him. A very common scene on the hazardous streets of Cairo where people run after overcrowded buses trying to catch them and are literally grabbed by fellow citizens and hold right into the moving bus. Let me look at that. That's the bus. That's the, uh, the scene. He's running, and he's you know he's being helped by other you know uh, bus riders. In another picture, Spider-Man is seen performing one of his stunts in the Cairo Metro. This is the one, and is met with indifference from the Metro riders. His superpowers are obviously of no interest to anyone. Consequently, making him just another fellow citizen stripped of any distinctive characteristics. In fact, ironically enough, when Spider-Man first appeared on the streets of Cairo, some people simplistically thought that the Deo Saad and Adif were sent by Abdel Fattah al-Sisi, the president of Egypt, who is probably perceived by many Egyptians as having saved Egypt from the Muslim Brotherhood and restored its identity. In this case, power and heroism shift from Spider-Man to the ex-army general, who is believed to have the interest of his people at heart, as he constantly claims and who works diligently to try and build Egypt. Backed by, backed by the Egyptian armed forces, Sisi falls back on the military institution to try and salvage a dysfunctional infrastructure. In fact, the army now has become the number one contractor in infrastructure project and is constantly intervening to cope with the catastrophes experienced almost daily in Egypt due to a dysfunctional system. Sisi therefore has become the superhero and Spider-Man merely one of his men. Any double identity Spider-Man may have enjoyed in the original story is lost when he became just another Egyptian experiencing, again an out of term, in words, a normal day of an Egyptian's life and feeling exhausted in the process. In fact, all Egyptians are superheroes for enduring these difficulties every day. Not only has Spider-Man lost his double identity, but also the sense of individualism which characterizes superheroes and assumes, in this case, a collective identity when he becomes just another every man, just another Egyptian. In short, we are now faced with a different set of characteristics than the three integral elements that characterize superheroes, which are a pro-social mission, extraordinary powers, and a double identity. These have vanished. Instead, we have a different model of heroism that does not attempt to appropriate these three elements, but rather moves beyond them, creating a homegrown <coughs> version that focuses on local concerns, and thereby decenters the US. When asked, for example, about their choice of Spider-Man over other superheroes, Adif and Saad said that Spider-Man's costume was cheaper than the other two. As trivial as this piece of information may be, I find it indicative of how local concerns, in this case, the limited budget of the project, can determine choices and other different interpret and offer different interpretations than, uh, that move away from the premise of American neoliberalism and from the enthusiastic consumption and appropriation of US culture. To my mind, this is a different intake on transnational American studies that moves away from both the exceptionalist and the comparative models. It attempts to subvert the centrality of the US and does not recreate a comparative discourse in the process. In this sense, I'm very conscious that this reading of the superhero phenomenon as manifested in the Egyptian culture is not perceived as an offshoot of US-based scholarship on American studies, which continues to be a problem to many of us who work in the field from a geographically transnational position but whose scholarship is continually being read as dependent upon US-based scholarship. 
This is a position that has been formulated and voiced by many scholars. I refer here particularly to Sheila Holmes and Julia Lane's argument in Geographies of American Studies of how the field is divided into a domestic US-based academy and home for the discipline and an offshoot of American studies abroad. The relation between the two is perceived in terms of a domestic center and a foreign margin. Such a division based on a predicated geography that takes for granted a US-based American studies clearly creates a hegemonic paradigm that ends up recreating American exceptionalism. I'm going to skip all the, the, the jargon, the theoretical jargon, and move on. To two, I'm going to conclude with two examples, going back to Pahaya. Maybe more than two examples, we have time. Um, the first example is Qahira, a web comic whose heroine, according to Dina Muhammad, the creator of the comic, is a female, visibly Muslim superhero who combats misogyny and Islamophobia. <coughs> Dina identifies herself as a female Muslim Egyptian artist. The comic was first published in 2013 in both English and Arabic. Now, according to Dina, Qahira has above average strength and superpowers. She can fly and owns a number of weapons, even though she does not use them. She fights against some of the social problems affecting women in Egypt, like sexual harassment and gender stereotyping. While it is easy to read Qahira, the Egyptian superheroine, as an attempt to subvert US cultural hegemony by presenting the counter version of, cat, of uh, Catwoman, wearing a hijab and fighting for the rights of Muslim women for a safe environment, and in this way assume that it is a reading that decenters the US from the paradigm, it would be misleading, I guess, because Qahira adheres to the three integral elements that characterizes the superhero tradition um, that I mentioned above, and which end up recreating the exceptionalist model all over again. Now, in contrast to this, for example, the undecided Bulbul, a film which was produced in 2010, offers a different model of heroism. The film tells the story of Nabil, whose name is Bulbul. Of course, Nabil is interesting because Nabil is, you know, Nabil Fawzi is the translated superhero in the very original uh, translations. The film tells the story of Nabil, whose nickname is Bulbul, and his love relations with two girls, and how undecided he feels about uh, both relations. So he goes to a woman therapist who herself suffers from the same problem, and she tries to help him until they fall in love. Instead of the womanizer who you would expect to meet in such a setup, we are introduced to a very hesitant um, person, unable to make up his mind and in need of help. In other words, not your usual superhero. Um, in this way, I think what he does is he deconstructs again the, the model of superheroism that we have in mind. And it is easy in, when reading it, when reading this model of superheroism, to actually read it apart as, as, as a model that has acquired a life of, it, of its own and is no longer dependent upon the U.S. model of superheroes. I want to read, um, this is another uh, series called al Um And uh, this is a new publication uh, published by, or rather uh, produced by um, three um, guys, John Meher, Mehdi Rafat, and Ahmed Rafat. And I want to read uh, um, just a couple of paragraphs from the uh, the, um, uh, the introduction to the series. Um, they start off by saying, "In Mabdoo Abtada, in Nina Ben Hebb comics superheroes, Ben Wahla Zayyadi, who can in Sina become fi comics superheroes Masriya, takis takis the waqa that we are living in in the community, and we become the Abtala Masriyin, we walk in the same challenges and challenges that we are as Masriyin in the face." سواء كانت مشاكلهم وصراعاتهم الداخلية أو الشر والفساد اللي بينشروه أو بتشوفه في مجتمعنا. So again, um, um, very briefly, that the, these people grew up reading superhero comics in, 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 in Egypt, and they always wanted to have, you know, Egyptian superheroes, and that is the reason why they actually, you know, came up with these superheroes. And again, superheroes who would, you know, who would. Um, uh, represent you know, our own set of problems in Egypt and kind of problems that we face in Egypt. Now, um, they end up by saying that they have um, they've called the series Al-Uzba, but also Al-Uzba al, al okay? So 
okay? And they explain why it's called al-'usba al-'adi. Usba هي كلمة يبدو في ظاهرها إنها عصابة، لكن هي في الحقيقة معناها مجموعة صغيرة. واللعب بالكلام ده مقصود لانه للاسف الشخص اللي بيقف في طريق الشر والفساد احيانا بيتم اتهامه انه مجرم ومن عصابه. So the fact that you know عصابه can be translated as you know a gang. But they, what they're saying is that it's not actually translated as a gang here, it's translated as a group of you know uh, people who stand in uh, you know um, to oppose you know uh, different kinds of evil that you can face. اما المعديين هي جمع كلمة معدي ودي كلمة بقت دارجة في اللغة العربية العامية معناها المطلق أو اللي ملوش زي بس معناها المطلق أو اللي ملوش زي بس بشوية تركيز في الكلمة معدي معناها بالفصحى العبور ودي كلمة ليها أهمية في تاريخنا المصري بالذات فالمعدي أي شخص ناجح هو الشخص اللي ينجح في تجاوز المشكلة أو عبورها وده التخصص بتاع الطنة عشان كده كان لازم يكونوا معديين عشان تاخدهم بمعنيين انهم مرتقين بلا حدود وينجحوا في عبور اي مشكله. Now, المعديين اوف كورس ده يعني وي سي ات ان كولوكيال ناو ده شخص معدي اوكي. Okay. I find this very interesting because in order to understand this you really have to be well versed in Arabic culture or in Egyptian culture actually rather than US culture. In fact if you're not aware of you know the implications of something like ma'addi, you will not be able to understand you know, where the heroism comes from. And this is a model that I would think is somehow in between. Um, um, it is definitely doesn't play right back into the old model of superheroism, which we've seen in the very early translations of Dar uh, al-Mabu'at al-Musawara or Dar al-Nahda. In other words, it's not just simply a construction of the original superhero comics. It moves beyond that. It doesn't, it doesn't, I don't think it actually, this is something I need to look into, it doesn't actually uh, reach the level of the photo stunt, okay, which completely breaks, you know, the model of superheroism. Because in this sense, they, um, they, uh, they assume <coughs> the identity of al al khariqin So they assume the identity of superheroes. Okay? That's where it comes from. And, um, and if you read through the, 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 the series, they do have some you know, uh, powers. Okay? Um, same as, for example, and these are models that are very interesting. Same as, for example, the model of Benat Superman, which is a series that was you know, played last Ramadan where you had three girls who were supposedly the daughters of uh, uh, Superman and who have each one of the, each one of them has you know uh, a different model of superpower one can read somebody's minds the other can read you know thoughts and somebody can predict the future and another person can move objects and so on so um, but all of these are and, and I think this takes us back to the title of the presentation which I'm still playing around with um, are these all Constructions or reconstructions or deconstructions of the model of superheroes. What is important to me is two things. Number one, what I'm concerned with is number one, offer a reading, again as I said, of um, superhead of the, the genre itself, super superhero genre, um, from the perspective of you know somebody who um, who lives you know beyond the borders of the nation state, beyond the borders of the US nation. Okay, so it's my own input about this genre as it is, you know, implemented and as it acquires a life of its own within the, um, the, the Arabic culture. But also, what I'm also very much concerned with and very uh, aware of what I'm doing is how I'm going about, you know, um, the, rather the methodology of going about you know, this project. So I'm going to give you an example. When I, uh, when I started looking at the, uh, the, the translated uh, Early translated series. Um, I said, okay, what I'm going to do is I'm going to read them on their own. I'm not going to look at you know, the original um, uh, comics, okay, the original uh, series. And I started doing that because I did not want to fall into the trap of the comparative model. But as I was doing that, I realized that that is not working. Out. Like as a researcher, if I wanted to know, if I wanted to find out whether I was, you know, whether these had actually somehow they, you know, broken the, 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 
you know, the super superhero uh, uh, genre or not, then I needed to look at you know the originals from which they were translated. And so I had to go back. And that was when I realized that actually the construction or constructing the constructing the, the, the genre in the Arabic translations was a mere construction. It did not deconstruct the genre. Because in order to actually because I had to actually look at both of them. I had to compare them. And in doing that, I was putting the US as my point of reference. I was putting the American, you know, early American, the, the, the original comics as my point of reference. I was reading the translated in light of the, uh, the original. This was problematic to me, which made me realize that with the photo stunt, I did not need to do that. I did not need to compare it with anything. And that is why I called, or I rather described, the photo stunt as a deconstruction of the, um, the genre, not only in the way that it breaks away with the three uh, characteristics that I mentioned, but also in the way that I approached the, um, um, the, 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 approach the, the model and tried it to. I think I will stop here, and there's a lot more to say, but I think I'm stopping. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, questions. We have time for a couple of questions before we run off the ground. Uh, yeah. But my question is, I guess I would like to ask, um, when you talk about U.S. culture or U.S. Uh, mainstream or superheroes, I, I guess I would like to know about how you're defining it in this body of Superheroes as they appear here, and you know, as people consume them through the, uh, the the comics, through the films, through the you know the video games, and so on. Okay, so I'm I'm trying to look at the way this is being appropriated into the uh, Egyptian slash Arabic culture. Okay, so I'm trying to find out. I'm trying to look into how this is taken up and somehow something else. Know, is um, 
it, it, it's, it's substituted with something else. As I told you, no, you know, we don't get to see you know, the exceptional models of, you know, how, you know, um, no, no, because, you know, I mean, how many, of, again, how many of, you know, how many of, you know, people actually know about it worldwide? I guess, but I guess my thing was because I'm not sure that I want to do to embrace jazz and hip hop in these particular rooms of, of American culture. They embrace parts of my culture. You get what I'm saying? And so yeah. even when I'm like, you know, watching on television, I see now, I mean, I think for a few weeks back, certainly in Germany, there are important matters culture and showing it, showing that this is a different side to U.S. culture. So I'm, I, I often wonder, mm, was there a possibility that, you know, that you were watching these type of films back in the 70s? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't, I, I don't know, but I doubt, actually. You know, I, I doubt, actually. Do you think, like, nowadays, Egyptian culture would be able to produce a superhero that, that the whole community would be able to um, look at in awe and costs of making such a character and the production of such like a film. Or maybe is it a cultural or religious obstacle that people would just we accept it because it's not our culture. He can be he can have these super powers. But if you present it in our culture then we're just kind of defying religion or defying God or whatever. Do you think that this is um, um okay now here's what I think. Do we want to actually create a, a hero that we look up I, I don't. I mean, that's not. I don't think that this is necessarily uh, where we should be going. I mean, the reason why the reason why I like the topics very much. So the study of this, you know, the films by the the, the Dale, is the fact that you know it does not create this wow character. I mean, I think one of the problems is that we always, you know, we need this super hero. We need a hero to look up to. And I don't necessarily think that that is, you know, that we necessarily end up in good when we do that, you know. So, um, but is there a need for that? Not a need. I mean, like, do you think it would happen? Like, they would, like, what kind of, if they were to produce a superhero, what kind of superhero would they come up with? Would it be something? Oh, maybe, maybe, maybe uh, this is what they're trying to, you know, some, you know, the three um, guys here, this is what they're trying to do, to create, you know, uh, a, 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 or, you know, a homegrown version of, 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 of the superhero. Point is that I am definitely against this. I don't see that this is necessarily a good model. You know, the whole idea of you know meeting. And, I mean, that was the rhetoric that you know that you know, came up after the uh, the, the revolution. You know, where's the leader? You know, we need a leader. This constant you know you know this constant savior, urgent need for a savior and uh, you know a leader, a, a hero, which I don't necessarily think is a good model from previous you know from previous experiences. I think the leader. If I may uh, sort of uh, intervene, uh, have you seen on the credits, uh, which is really a parody of Harry Potter, actually, where he is a Muslim uh, child with uh, um, superhuman powers. Uh, on the credits? On the credits. Uh, on the credits, the, the, the preacher. Uh, there I am. So, and this attempt was to construct a little superhero who would actually uh, sort of uh, not uh, violate or um, um, uh, unsettle uh, relig the religious. You know, he is a you know, he's a believer, a Muslim mu'min, practicing, and his powers actually derive from his um, powers of belief, faith. of faith. I and mean, this is what the ninety-nine years tried to do. Um, the, you know, when they took their powers from the you know this half thing, as well Hosna. Uh, this is what they. But also interesting, of course, is that you have 99 and Osborne, this idea of group. Of a group. Yeah. Rather, rather than, than an rather than one. Just to one. Yeah. Um, Nina, thank you so much. Oh, for yeah. I'm sorry we're going back. You can yes, continue the conversation elsewhere if there's a class in here. And we don't want to talk away. Thank you so much. Thank you.